good afternoon good evening as the situation the place you are in welcome to afarm school webinar and this is the virtual sixth webinar we have started in june 21 the afarm school webinar in addition to the afarm monthly webinar which are continuing still uh, since june 2020 so today's afarm school is on current trades in theranostics and it's a very very important topic and a lot of research and a lot of developments are happening into this thing we have four eminent speaker dr jack ash kevin and daniel and this uh webinar the school will be moderated by professor eva bezak she will introduce the speakers place and everything just i will take few minutes to introduce today's moderator professor eva bezak who do not need any introduction she is a very very well known figure however i will try she is working Uh, professor eva bezak is a professor in medical radiations and center director for translation cancer research at the university of south australia previously she was chief physicist at the department of medical physics royal adelaide hospital she has co-authored over 170 papers 200 conference presentations and co-authored books on medical physics and supervised over 35 phd and msc students specializing on computational radiation biology she has a mastery in this thing she is the vice president of the afarm the secretary general of the iompp and a member of ac4 international commission on medical physics of the international union of pure and applied physics she is the past chair of the international union of physical and engineering scientists in medicines women in medical physics and biomedical engineering task group she has a huge experience with the short introduction i hand over the floor to professor eva bezak its floor is your professor eva yeah. uh thank you i'll just start sharing my screen from the beginning sure can you please see my screen yeah and can you see the slide show please uh just you have to do that slide show okay thank you it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, today's speakers who are all my very good colleagues from south australia and the topic of theranostic imaging will see perhaps one of the largest growth trends in the area of medical radiations and medical radiation physics uh, i would like to without much ado invite dr jake foster who is a nuclear medicine medical physics registrar from South Australian Medical Imaging to introduce the topic to you. Thank you Jake over to you. Thank you Eva. Can someone just confirm that my microphone's working please? Yes. Yes, great. Thank you. And is my screen sharing? Now? No. Yes. Yes, good. Perfect. Excellent. So it's, let me just start my timer so I don't lose track of time. Uh, so it's my pleasure to present you with a brief overview of theranostics, uh, which some predict will feature prominently in the future of radiotherapy. So radionuclide therapy is an umbrella term that refers to any administration of an unsealed radioactive source for a therapeutic procedure. So all radionuclide therapies are targeted in one way or another meaning there's some mechanism by which the radionuclide localizes predominantly at the target. So for example, a treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma and liver metastases involves injecting yttrium-90 microspheres into an artery that directly supplies the liver tumors, causing the microspheres to embolize and become permanently lodged in the tumor vasculature. 
or it could be something more sophisticated, like having the radionuclide in a chemical form that binds to a receptor overexpressed on cancer cells. So most commonly, the radiopharmaceutical is administered, is administered intravenously uh, to achieve a systemic effect, which is ideal for cancers in the metastatic setting. Uh, this way, the radionuclide is able to reach every cancer cell in the body. Um, this is unlike surgical resection or external beam radiotherapy, which are more appropriate for localized disease. Chemotherapy is the most common type of therapy for metastatic disease, but is notoriously non-targeted, resulting in unpleasant side effects and morbidity. Um, so radionuclide therapy can provide a wide reach of chemotherapy, but hopefully with minimal or no normal tissue toxicities. So radionuclide therapy is ideally one half of a larger model called Theranostics. So we appreciate that every patient, tumor and cancer cell is different. So as a result, we cannot know a priori exactly how effective a targeting mechanism will be for a given patient. So, but the success of the therapy, of course, depends on this. So in some cases, it is also important that there be limited radioactivity taken up by healthy organs to avoid normal tissue toxicity. So ideally, we would find this out beforehand. And this is the basis of Theranostics. So we evaluate uptake by the target in images first, and then if there is appropriate uptake, we administer the targeted therapy. So Theranostics has gained major traction in the last decade, for reasons I'll get to shortly. But it's worth noting that Theranostics is really um, as old as radionuclide therapy itself. So for some historical background, the first ever radionuclide therapy was administered in 1941, when Saul Hertz gave iodine-131 to a patient with hypothyroidism, so exploiting the chemical uptake of iodine via the sodium iodine supporter expressed on follicular cells of the thyroid. I131 was used for the first time on thyroid cancer in the same year. So the gamma chroma, which we still use today, was invented in 1958. And in a quick literature search, I was able to access an article as early as 1962 uh, describing the practice of theranostics. So I quote, Using R131, functioning metastases were demonstrated in 11 of 26 patients with follicular or papillary thyroid cancer. And in three of these patients, the results of the scans were a decisive influence in attempting radioiodine therapy. So radioiodine remains to this day a staple in the treatment of thyroid toxicosis and thyroid cancer. And in Australia, we still do with varying frequency diagnostic scans with R131, or now the PET agent I124, before administering the ablative therapy for radioiodine for thyroid cancer. So Theranostics has taken off in the last decade due to major technological developments in molecular biology. So we now develop and produce biomolecules that target and bind to particular receptors expressed on cancer cells. So this could be a peptide that targets a peptide receptor or an antibody that targets an antigen. So it was realized that we can label this functionally active biomolecule with a radionuclide in such a way that it still efficiently binds to the target receptor or antigen. So the cleverness of this approach is that, unlike with iodine for hypothyroidism or thyroid cancer, we're not relying on the chemical properties of the radionuclide to target the cells. The targeting is, is, the targeting is entirely dictated by the biomolecule. So this means that we can label it with a diagnostic radionuclide when we want to evaluate the uptake in the patient, and then label it with a therapeutic radionuclide when we want to administer the therapy. So, and be reasonably confident that the biological uptake and the clearance will be the same uh, in the therapy as we saw in the diagnostic images. So this is a powerful and versatile model. Um, as we know, there are a huge number of receptors expressed on cells, many of which are overexpressed on cancer cells. So each present an avenue to selectively attack cancer. And indeed, we've seen a massive proliferation in the development of these biomolecule targeting vectors. So an example of the new Theranostics paradigm in action is the gallium dotate and lutetium dotate for neuroendocrine tumors or neuroendocrine neoplasms. So the left image is a positron emission tomography image. So the positron emitter gallium 68 was labeled to octreotate, which is an analog of the somatostatin, uh, of somatostatin, which targets the somatostatin receptor and which happens to be expressed by neuroendocrine tumors. So this image is showing that the patient has many neuroendocrine tumor metastases which are taking up the octreo tape. And in this case, it was deemed appropriate to proceed with the therapy. So for the therapy, the octreo tape was labeled with lutetium-177, which is a beta emitter with a six-day half-life. So in addition to betas, lutetium-177 graciously emits some gammas that we can image fairly well with our gamma cameras. 
as shown on the right. So these are whole body planar images of lutate at several time points following administration, showing the lutate was indeed taken up by the same lesions as the gate. And you can see it clearing from the body over time as a result of the physical decay and the biological clearance. So regarding the biomolecule targeting vectors, there are two main categories. So there are peptides that target peptide receptors on cells, and there are antibodies that target antigens on cells. Um, so leading to two subtypes of radionuclide therapy and theranosics that we call peptide receptor radionuclide therapy and radio immunotherapy. So I believe you have to wait until the next speaker to hear more about this. So what about the radionuclides that we label to the targeting vectors? So the radionuclides that we use for the diagnostic imaging are typically positron emitters because positron emission tomography images are superior to, are superior to SPECT or single photon emission computed tomography images. Gallium-68 is commonly used, which has a short half-life of 68 minutes. So a short half-life is ideal if we only want to evaluate uptake at one time point. After the images are acquired, we want the radioactivity to quickly decay away and stop depositing energy in the patient. In the early days of neuroendocrine tumor theranostics, whole body planar gamma scintigraphy was used to evaluate receptor expression. So not even the tomographic version, uh, SPECT. So the image on the left is a whole body planar of indium-111 labeled to octreotide. So indium-111 emits Auger and conversion electrons plus gammas that we can image. Whereas the image on the right is gallium-68 dotatate, a PET. In this case, it's a maximum intensity projection, MIP. Um, so this is the same patient, which and it's showing a huge improvement in diagnostic quality with the GATE. So in this case, it even altered the patient's clinical management as it showed that they had diffuse metastases that were not seen on the Indium scan. This is another example showing the superior, superiority of gallium-68 PET over whole body planars with Indium. So in my opinion, image-based screening is the crowning jewel of theranostics especially with the modern approach of conjugating radionuclides to targeting vectors. So all cancer therapies that target receptors on cancer cells are inherently fragile. So their success depends on the cancer cells expressing the receptor. So the same is true for all targeted therapies, including immunotherapies and hormonal therapies. Outside of theranostics, receptor expression is assessed by biopsying the tumor, but we know that receptor expression can be highly heterogeneous between different tumors in the same patient, and even in different regions inside the same tumor. So likewise for histopathological grading. So biopsies cannot tell the whole story. But in theranostics, we effectively produce 3D images of receptor expression throughout the entire tumor burden. We also combine these 3D images um, with 3D images of metabolic activity that we get from the FDG PET scans. So this information viewed together gives us a much better chance of predicting whether a therapy will be successful or not and we can start to develop rigorous criteria for when a therapy is indicated. So as an example, patients with net neuroendocrine tumor, NET, will undergo a GATE, which shows the expression of the somatostatin receptors by the tumors, but they'll also have an FDG PET scan. So FDG is a glucose analog. So an FDG scan shows, the, shows how metabolically active the tumors are. So even if we see that there are tumors taking up GATE, if there are lots of FDG aperture tumors that are not taking up GATE, then lutate may not be very effective at slowing down the patient's disease progression or alleviating their symptoms. So next I'll briefly discuss our options for the radionuclide that we label to our targeting vector for the therapy. So most commonly we use a beta emitter such as yttrium-90 or lutetium-177. So betas are low LET, meaning they're sparsely ionizing and do not deliver much um, radiobiological bang for the buck. They travel distances of the order of centimeters. So they deposit some of their beta dose in normal tissue surrounding the target. Um, this isn't optimal, but it does have a silver lining. So the downfall of targeted therapies in general, not just radionuclide therapies, is that they're, um, they're targeted. So it's, it's highly unlikely that every cell, every cancer cell in a tumor will express any one given receptor. But with betas, cells not expressing the receptor will still receive some dose. And this is called the crossfire effect. Alpha emitters may prove to be superior to beta emitters, so they have a high LET and hence a high biological effect per unit absorbed dose. Their short range of one to five cell diameters, diameters also offers impressive normal tissue sparing. But alpha emitters have their limitations. So foremost is their limited supply currently, particularly of the prized actinium-225. 
There's also an issue with alpha emitters that have long decay chains with long lived daughters, particularly when some of the daughters are alpha emitters themselves. We expect that their recoil in an alpha decay has sufficient energy to break the conjugation to the targeting vector or its bound complex. So progeny will be freely circulating and distributing according to their chemical properties, which could potentially result in large doses to normal tissue. This is a famous picture that illustrates the promise of alpha emitters. So lutetium-177 bound to the small molecule PSMA-617 can be used to target PSMA, which is overexpressed on prostate cancer. So a patient with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer had their disease progress after receiving lutetium-177 PSMA. But when the alpha emitter, actinium-225, was labeled to PSMA-617 instead, um, the same patient's disease burden drastically reduced. Let's take a closer look at the modern theranostics that we're doing right now in the clinic. So the first success story has been gallium-68 and lutetium-177 dotatate, referred to as GATTE or lut and lutate respectively, um, for neuroendocrine tumor. So nets are uncommon. So they, they can start off in various organs, commonly in bowel and pancreas, um, and they metastasize all over the place, but often to liver, lymph nodes, and bone. Uh, they have the property that they secrete hormones. And the ones that secrete serotonin can produce unpleasant symptoms like redness and flushing. So low-grade nets are treated with a long-acting somatostatin analog because it's been found that agonizing the somatostatin receptor um, expressed by nets has an anti-proliferative effect in itself. For high-grade nets, chemotherapy is one of the options, and now we would also consider treating them with lutate quite frequently. As I've mentioned, lutate and gatate use the somatostatin analog of triotate to target the somatostatin receptor, often expressed by NETS. So lutate has been used to treat NETS um, since the early 2000s in university hospitals in the Netherlands and in Germany under compassionate use. But it wasn't until uh, we had this phase three clinical trial, the NETA1 trial, until these results were published that lutate has now started to really take off. So this trial confirmed significant improvement in progression free survival and overall survival from lutate plus octreotide compared to octreotide alone. The FDA and European, European Medical Association approved lutate for progressive nets as a result of this trial. In Australia, however, it's not approved and we're forced to access it by the special access scheme. I described previously how we use GATTE as part of the screening process um, and it's also used part of the treatment follow-up. So lutate is delivered in four cycles, each of about 7.4 gigabecrels, and there's eight weeks between cycles. So this is an example of a patient who was an excellent candidate for lutate. They were diagnosed with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor um, and had some of their METs surgically removed. They were then worked up for lutate, and the FDG PET is shown on the left, and the GATTE PET is shown on the right. So the somatostatin receptor images show more uptake than the FDG images, which means this is a low-grade disease and lutate was expected to be very effective. Now from left to right, I'm showing again the pretreatment GATTE scan on the far left. Um, next, I've got the spec images of the lutate from the first cycle, confirming the expected uptake. Um, then I've shown the lutate images after cycle number four. Uh, and we can see that within six months, we achieved a fantastic response ablating almost all of the neuroendocrine tumors. The fantastic treatment response was confirmed by the post-treatment GATTE scan on the far right. There was also a CT 12 months later, indicating that we achieved sustained progression-free survival. The next success story has been gallium and lutetium PSMA for metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is not uncommon. It's the second most diagnosed cancer in men and the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality in men. Metastatic, castrate, or sorry, metastatic prostate cancer is treated first with medical castration, um, but this only really holds progression for a couple of years, after which time it will progress and become castrate or metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. The treatments are then taxane based chemotherapy or androgen axis drugs, um, but now lutetium PSMA is also becoming an option. So, PSMA is an antigen expressed on prostate cells, but it's overexpressed about a thousand fold on almost all prostate cancers. And its progression, uh, sorry, its expression also increases with increasing disease progression. 
PSMA617 is a small molecule inhibitor of the PSMA receptor that can be used to target prostate cancer. So when conjugated to lutetium-177, we call it lutetium PSMA and similar for gallium-68. So the first phase three trial for gallium and lutetium PSMA was published this year, and it was a major success. So the, the participants of the trial were gallium PSMA positive and, and had received at least one androgen access drug and one or two taxane therapies previously. So these are quite heavily pre-treated participants. And lutetium-177 PSMA showed significant benefit of the standard of care alone. So the FDA approval is anticipated to follow early next year. So there's some improvement uh, when it comes to choosing, um, there's some room for improvement when it comes to choosing the administered activities that we administer um, for these radionuclide therapies. So one obvious thing that we should be taking into account is patient specific dosimetry. So for example, the administered activity could be chosen such that the dose to an organ at risk is constrained to a threshold for the normal tissue toxicity. So typically the organs at risk in radionuclide therapy are bone marrow and kidneys. However, calculating doses to tumors and organs at risk is more difficult in radionuclide therapy than it is in external beam radiotherapy. The symmetry for radionuclide therapy requires information about the patient's biological uptake and clearance of the radiopharmaceutical in each of the different organs, um, which we call collectively the biokinetics. So this can be determined, for example, by a combination of images of the radionuclides emissions uh, and blood samples at multiple time points following the administration. We can then take this biokinetic information and calculate doses to tumors and normal tissue by using MERD spheres or MERD coefficients for reference phantoms, or by using images of accumulated activity in the patient and applying dose convolution kernels or Monte Carlo particle transport codes. With the rise of alpha radionuclide therapy, um, owing to the very short range of the alphas, microdosimetry will also be important to assess the radiobiological effects of these alpha-emitting radiopharmaceuticals. ASTRO, which is a multidisciplinary radiation oncology society, has forecast that the future of radiotherapy is molecular. So by 2035, they predict that 60% of radiotherapy will be radionuclide therapies. With external beam radiotherapy and sealed source brachytherapy, counting for only 40%. This is a very bold claim. So what do we need to do or what needs to happen for us to get there? So when a treatment is found to be safe and effective, we need to get out there and spread the word. We need phase three clinical trials so that these radiopharmaceuticals receive approval from the regulating bodies. We should push for trials to occur at earlier disease stages. So it's very difficult to be effective when the disease has seen several lines of treatment previously. Radionuclide therapies may prove to be remarkably beneficial at earlier stages um, and potentially with less toxicities than the current standard treatments. We also need to address global radionuclide supply issues. So certainly with alpha emitters like actinium-225, but even with the lutetium-177 supply, um, that will be really under the pump when lutetium PSMA receives the FDA approval. And what must we have by the time that we get there? So I think we have a responsibility to implement the symmetry to a greater extent in the clinic. So one size fits all activity prescriptions is obviously not the optimal approach. And we should be dedicating more manpower toward the symmetry for radionuclide therapies, at least where there is obvious clinical benefit. So the Council of the European Union issued a directive in 2013 stating that for all radiotherapies, including radionuclide therapies, exposures of target volumes shall be individually planned, taking into account doses to non-targeted volumes. So this is arguably excessive, but it shows that we have a long way to go. Um, a couple of thank yous to contributors of the presentation. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jake, for an excellent introduction to Theranostics. May I quickly please ask you, uh, how do, can we source actinium-225? How do you produce this isotope? So currently it's produced by using stockpiles of uranium left over from when they were um, preparing for World War II um, or World War III. So um, I'm not sure how it can be produced in a reactor. Uh, perhaps it can be, but 
at the moment, all we use basically decaying uranium uh, in order to produce actinium-225. I think it can be also produced on a cyclotron on the accelerator as, a, as another one. Yeah, but that's only sort of a growing, growing area. I presume that's the reason for the shortage. Uh, Jake, do we know anything more about the RB of alpha particles in the nuclear uh, nuclear medicine, radionuclide therapy? Well, the RB is a bit of a difficult thing because it depends on the endpoint that you're looking at. Exactly. So you, you could measure an RB for a clonogenic cell survival assay, but then uh, how relevant is that to some effects that you would observe in in vivo? I'm not sure. So yeah, we have a lot of work to do in radiobiology, particularly in the nuclear medicine, I think. Yeah. Would you guess RB value or you don't want to go there? <laughs> no, I, I don't guess if I'm not yeah. sure, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the in vitro and in vivo studies show between five to seven. But of course, as you said, it really depends on whether you can translate those results to a real in vivo. Uh, situation. So yeah, there is, I think, lots of scope for medical physics work. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, our next speaker is Miss Ashley Hall, who is a nuclear medicine technologist and also a PhD candidate at the University of South Australia. And actually her PhD project is on the development of a radiopharmaceutical that uses actinium-225 to be used for treatment of pancreatic cancer. However, today, Ash will give us an overview of current and upcoming Theranostic radiopharmaceuticals. Over to you, Ash. Jake, can you stop sharing? Thank you, Ash, can you start sharing? Fantastic. Beautiful. You can see that. You can hear me all right? Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. All righty. Um, well, thanks, Eva, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, as Eva mentioned, today I'll be discussing the current and upcoming radio pharmaceuticals in Theranostics. Um, just as a disclaimer, I am obviously based in Australia, so a lot of my views are coming from an Australian perspective. Um, so some radio pharmaceuticals you may see in your part of the world may differ. Um, and there's also quite a lot of radio pharmaceuticals that are coming up, um, which, again, I can't touch on all of them in the time limit. Um, so I've just selected some that I find interesting. So I thought I'd just start by defining what a radiopharmaceutical is. Um, so the IAEA define radiopharmaceuticals as radioisotopes which are bound to biological molecules that are able to target specific organs, tissues or cells within the human body. Now, depending on what targeting vector you're using, you can then have different types of radiopharmaceuticals, for example, a radioligand, a radioimmunoconjugate or a radiotracer. But essentially, most radiopharmaceuticals are comprised of three main parts, with our radioisotope, which is bound to our targeting vector using a chelator. Um, so as Jake mentioned before, our radioisotope will allow us to have either the imaging or therapy potential, and then the targeting vector helps us get to whatever receptor we're trying to target um, on the cell. So I thought I'll just go through these three individual components um, quickly. So first up, here's a table of some diagnostic radionuclides. Um, not all, it's definitely not comprehensive, um, but you can see that most of them are either positron or gamma um, emitting. As Jake mentioned, we are leaning more towards positron emitters because the PET image quality um, is superior. You will notice that most of these diagnostic radionuclides have um, relatively short half-lives. Um, so most of them, half-life is below 12 hours. And for two on this slide, um, the copper 64 and the iodine 131, these both also undergo beta minus decay, as well as either the positron or gamma emissions. Um, so they can be used both for diagnostic purposes, and then you can also up the dose and potentially use them um, in a therapeutic application. So they're kind of theranostic um, by themselves. In terms of the therapeutic radionuclides, we of course have our alpha or our beta emitters. Um, and again, as Jake touched on, there's different levels of cytotoxicity depending on whether it's an alpha or a beta emitter. 
Um, I did want to point out, though, that the half-life of these therapeutic radium nuclides is much longer usually um, compared to the diagnostic isotopes. Um, and this is actually quite useful because it gives time for our radiopharmaceutical to be taken up by the cell before uh, the radionuclide starts undergoing those decays. Now onto the targeting vectors. Um, so the two main vectors are your peptide or your antibody. Peptides are generally synthetic in nature, um, and that means you can modify them more so that they're able to be chelated or radio-labeled at um, higher temperatures, which will allow them to be more efficient in that process. They're also quite small um, peptides. As you can see here, they're about one kilodalton in size. Um, because they're that size, they're able to penetrate tum uh, tumors quite quickly, and they've got quite quick um, pharmacokinetics when they're in the body. Now, some peptides may undergo some degradation in the body um, due to enzymes, so they could have a short biological half-life, and often they can be excreted by the kidneys, um, which would lead to a high renal dose when they're radio-labeled. But it is important to note that that high renal dose is quite common for a range of targeting vectors. It's not just exclusive to using a peptide. Now, in terms of the antibodies, um, antibodies are a bit different because some antibodies can actually trigger an immune response if they're just used by themselves. And that's kind of that concept of immunotherapy. And then you can further enhance that effect if you attach a therapeutic radionuclide to it. Unfortunately, because antibodies are a more natural product, um, there are more limitations on what environment you can have them in. So you wouldn't really want to exceed radiolabeling in or going above 37 degrees Celsius or using a, a high or a low pH range because um, they become unstable. But one of the main drawbacks of antibodies is that they're quite large. So this top figure here for IgG, um, that's a type of antibody. It's about 150 kilodaltons in size. So compared to the peptide, you can see there's a bit of a size difference. Um, and because it is so large, it means it's a lot slower in being taken up by the tumours. Now, there has been some work to try and improve those in vivo kinetics, um, and that's by using certain fragments of the antibodies, and that's all these other figures um, left over on the slide here. And so they have been proving to be um, quite useful at getting the same immune effects um, without the entire um, fully intact antibody. So next up, we have the nanoparticles. Um, so nanoparticles are an interesting field that's um, starting to really come a long way. There's quite a wide range of compositions and size and shapes. And the great thing about them is that most of the time you can modify those size and shapes to meet different functions. Unfortunately, at the moment, sometimes they can be difficult to manufacture, um, but the main drawback of nanoparticles is that they are still very much in that developmental phase um, and still waiting some approvals before they're able to be used clinically. Um, but I think it's very much a watch this space and see where they come over the next few years. The final vector I thought I would touch on is the concept of metabolism. So this is a bit different to the other ones in that I'm considering uh, where a radionuclide is metabolized by the body or it can bind to certain cells without the need for an additional targeting vector. So a great example is the radioactive iodine, um, where this is taken up by the thyroid cells in exactly or mostly exactly the same way as a normal dietary iodine would be in the body. Um, so it definitely simplifies the process because you don't have to try and label anything to that iodine. But obviously, there's a limited application in what radionuclides could be metabolized by the body. So to bind the targeting vector to our radionuclide, we usually need to do chelation. Um, this can vary a lot between what radionuclide you're using um, and what targeting vector you're using. Um, and it all depends on the geometry and the chemistry of the two. Um, I won't get into it very much at all today, but some of the common examples are a DOTA or a DFO chelator. Um, and if you are interested in chelators, then I really recommend this paper by Price and Orvig. Um, it steps through what chelator is better suited for what radio metal quite well. Now, the next few slides, I thought I'd go through some of the current diagnostic pairs that are used in a clinical setting. Um, thankfully, Jake has already done a lot of the background for these as well, so it should be relatively quick. So first off, we have the iodine 131. So this is considered the original theranostic, um, and it was first used in the 1940s to target um, thyroid cancer or thyrotoxicosis as well. Excuse me, I'll just get some water. <coughs> Sorry. 
sorry. Now ID131 is special in two ways. Firstly, it can act on that um, metabolism by the thyroid cells. So we don't need to attach a biological vector, which is great. Oh goodness. Um, secondly, it can be both a beta and a gamma emitter. So there is potential to use it for both your pre-therapy scans using a lower dose and then upping the dose um, for a therapeutic purpose um, if you'd like, or if the pre-therapy scan shows that. There are also some other diagnostic agents you could use instead, like ID123 or ID124. And these are both transported into the thyroid in the same way as ID131. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes. So here is just a case study of the ID131 theranostic. So this patient initially had a pre-therapy scan. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so this patient initially had a pre-therapy scan using 140 megabecals of iodine-131. And as you can see, there were some uptake um, in the functioning metastases throughout. Um, the patient then received a therapeutic dose of iodine-131. And this first image is their scan at one day after that therapeutic administration. And it can, you can see the uptake is quite similar. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, to that pre-therapy scan. And then another eight days later, or seven days after that first um, therapeutic scan, you can see those lesions even more clearly um, because the background activities had time to wash out. Um, and again, it, it's showing the same pattern. So it's a real classic case of an optimal um, theranostic in action. Next up, we have the gallium and lutetium dodotate. Um, so you will find throughout the talk that both gallium and lutetium are quite a common theranostic pair. It's partly because they have um, similar chemistries and they're able to bind to the same um, complexes in a relatively similar manner, um, which is very good. Um, so the dodotate is a form of the octreotate, as Jake mentioned, um, and it's designed to target the somatostatin receptor which is known to be overexpressed in the neuroendocrine tumors, um, but it can also be applied to other malignancies which are overexpressed, um, such as neuroblastoma or meningioma. This is just a quick picture demonstrating the concept. Um, I don't think I need to touch on it too much, um, but again, we have a gallium PET CT image here showing uptake, um, and then that is also, that uptake pattern was also demonstrated on the lutetium dodotate um, scan as well. And that's just one of the benefits of using lutetium is that you do have those gamma emissions which are imageable. Um, you can get quite decent images out of it um, considering it's primarily therapeutic. Now, if you have a good eye, you will notice that this scan is actually a gallium dota top scan. Um, and you may be wondering how that differs to dota tape. Well, essentially the dota tape is octreotate. The dota top is an octreotide. And then there's also a third option, the dota knock which is another octreotide, um, but that linker has changed. So these are all different somatostatin analogues. Um, they can all bind to gallium and lutetium and to the somatostatin receptor, um, but that binding efficiency between them is slightly different. because They've got slightly different structures in chemistries. Um, so the Dota Tate um, has about a 10 times greater binding efficiency to the somatostatin receptor subtype 2. And that is uh, the subtype 2 receptor is what's commonly overexpressed in neuroendocrine tumours. So having that improved binding efficiency is preferred um, to target it better. Now, you can also um, look at potentially different therapeutic radionuclides um, attaching to the dota tape. Um, there's the yttrium 90, which has been looked at, but unfortunately it had um, more severe renal toxicity than the lutetium dota tape. And then there's also work into looking at the actinium dodotate, um, but those investigations are still ongoing. And then in a slightly different um, uh, 
take, there's also the copper 64, copper 67 sartate. So this is um, also targets the somatostatin receptors, um, but it's still in trials for neuroblastoma, meningioma and neuroendocrine tumors. We then have the PSMA targeting. So PSMA is that prostate specific membrane antigen, which is commonly overexpressed in prostate cancers. Um, there are quite a range of different variants of the PSMA inhibitor, which is what's attached to the radionuclide. Um, and you can see from the side here that PSMA 11, 6, 1, 7, and the INT, they all have the same binding motive. So that's what's attaching to the PSMA antigen, but their chelators and linkers differ, um, which is how you get these different names. Most commonly um, in Australia, it's still the gallium PSMA and the lutetium PSMA. Um, but I believe this 18F um, imaging option has just been approved by the FDA in the US. And there's ongoing research into whether the actinium 225 PSMA um, is beneficial. And Jake had that lovely picture, which was showing how um, promising it is. Um, so here's just another quick picture comparing the uptake for the gallium and lutetium PSMA, where again, you can see um, the lutetium PSMA has gone exactly um, where the gallium indicated it would go. Um, so now that we've gone through what's currently happening in a clinical setting, either in late stage clinical trials or routine practice, I thought I'd touch on some of the upcoming theranostics. Um, so as I mentioned before, there are quite a few that are coming up. Um, so I've selected some that I think are quite interesting based on their concepts. First up, we have the fibroblast activation protein. So this is a protein which is overexpressed on cancer-associated fibroblasts. And these cancer-associated fibroblasts are a key component of a tumour microenvironment, which studies are starting to show is a really important part of a tumour that we want to target because it's quite often involved in disease progression. And these um, caps help build up the stromal network around the tumour. So you can see in the first um, part of the image, here's normal tissue, and it's quite spread out, um, the extracellular matrix. But as uh, cancer progresses and becomes more advanced, that matrix becomes more dense and it becomes fibrotic. Um, and because of that, therapies aren't as easily able to penetrate through that stroma, so they're less effective. So by targeting um, these cancer associated fibroblasts using the um, fat protein, we're hopefully able to help break down some of that stroma. And then it gives potential that if you give these uh, radionuclide therapies in combination with another therapy like chemotherapy, you might be able to help um, or have synergistic effects because you're breaking that stroma down and allowing the chemotherapy to enter the cell or the tumour um, more effectively. One of the key um, benefits of the fibroblast activation protein is that it's overexpressed on a lot of cancers. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to look into some of these cancers that are often forgot about, like pancreatic cancer or esophageal cancer. So this slide just shows some of the differences in uptake between the gallium uh, 68 FAPI. Um, FAPI is just the inhibitor form of the fibroblast activation protein. And these are just compared to the 18F FDG, which is our standard routine PET that looks at um, metabolism. And you can see the figures are, are relatively similar um, and quite good quality for both of them. At the moment, the gallium 68 labelled FAPI is kind of the main focus looking at targeting this protein, um, but there have also been some studies that looked at the 18F and the copper 64 as well. At the moment, the theranostic potential of the FAPI protein um, is more limited, um, but there has been some studies that looked at actinium, yttrium 90, um, and also a recent study that looked at lutetium um, FAPI as well. So it's definitely coming up in potential. It just needs a bit of time to evaluate all of these options. So the recent clinical study um, is shown here where they have the gallium 68 FAPI. Um, the 2286 is just one variant of the protein inhibitor you can use. And then they um, gave the patient the lutetium um, labelled variant after. And you can see that the, the primary tumours in here are, um, all took up the, the lutetium after. Um, there may be something slightly showing up here. Um, it's obviously not as intense as the gallium, though. Um, but it's just still in its early phases. So we'll see where that goes. 
Um, another concept which I find particularly interesting is targeting hypoxia. So hypoxia is defined as an oxygen deficiency. And in cancerous um, or in tumours, we find that the cancer cells get really good at migrating away from the blood vessels. And as they do that, they lose um, all the oxygen is less able to diffuse down. Um, so you can see that here where there's a blood vessel and then we have these hypoxic cells and then we come down to the necrotic region and these are cells that are completely starved of oxygen. So they are effectively dead. Unfortunately, as cells become more hypoxic, they also become more resistant to chemotherapy simply because the chemotherapy can't diffuse down like the oxygen. And they can also become more resistant to external beam radiation therapy. And that's all related to the um, oxygen enhancement effect. So by targeting that hypoxic region, um, again, we may be able to help improve the effects of some of the other conventional therapies. Um, at the moment, the copper 64 and copper 67 labeled ATSM appears to be quite promising in this field. Um, and it's been used in the gliomas, head and neck cancers, cervical, lung and rectal cancers. And I'm sure there's potential for it to be used in other solid cancers, which often have these hypoxic regions. There has also been some work using the 18FF MISO. Um, this was found to be really good at detecting the severe hypoxic regions. So probably those regions that are just bordering on this necrotic um, area but it's more difficult to detect mild to moderate hypoxia, um, so probably those closer to the aerobic cells, um, which is one of its downfalls, unfortunately. Now, a bit of a different one is the use of the conium-89 apomab. So apomab targets a certain protein which is expressed by dead cancer cells. If you think back to the slide I just discussed, um, this is talking more about that necrotic region down the bottom where nothing can really get down to. At the moment, it's being assessed for both lung and ovarian cancer. And it kind of works as a reverse theranosti, where in this animal study, they initially gave one set of mice chemotherapy and the other set of mice remained um, untreated. They then had the uh, zirconium apomab given and the PET images were taken. And you can see in the untreated, um, the area of uptake is more spread out, whereas it's really a lot more focal in the zircon, or sorry, in the chemotherapy treated. That's because it's able to target um, those cells that have been killed by chemotherapy. At the moment, they haven't really looked at labeling apomab with a therapeutic radionuclide, but it's definitely potential there as well. And it may act a bit like the hypoxia targeting where it's able to enter the tumors and help um, penetrate some of those regions uh, a bit more effectively than what we currently can. Um, so it's definitely another one to watch this space on. Uh, we then have the targeting of cancer stem cells. So a cancer stem cell has an unlimited ability to replicate. Um, and because of this, it's quite often involved in the progression of disease. And so the primary aim of a lot of cancer therapies are to kill these cancer stem cells because ultimately they're going to be the ones that are going to regrow and allow the tumours to regrow, even if you've killed all the other cells. And they also are involved in the radio resistance of your cells. Thankfully, there are a few markers on the cancer stem cells that we could potentially target in a theranostic approach. Um, just got a few listed on the slide. Now, the diagnostic um, radio pharmaceutical currently most used for cancer stem cells is the copper 64 ATSM. So that was the one that was also used for hypoxia image. So it does have a bit of a dual role, which makes it um, even more interesting. In terms of therapeutic um, cancer stem cell targeting, there's been an astatine 211 map and also an ID 131 map. And what I find most interesting about this is that the astatine was used to target uh, leukemia, which is obviously a blood cancer whereas ID131 was used for colorectal cancer, which is a solid cancer. And traditionally, a lot of the time, you've had your blood cancer therapies have been grouped in a separate category to what you would um, treat a solid cancer for. Um, so whether the cancer stem cells allows uh, for more therapies across the board um, and across different cancer types will be interesting to see. And so this figure just represents um, the differences in the areas of uptake between the copper ATSM and also the 18 FDG. So based on the FDG figure, you would say that the core of the tumor is the most metabolically active region. 
But the copper ATS stem is saying, well, actually the more hypoxic region and the region with the cancer stem cells, which we want to target, is more around that, um, I want to say left to upper region. So it may lead to treatments being targeted in a different manner to what the FDG pair is actually showing you. Um, now, there are a few longer term potentials um, that I'll go through on the next slide. So obviously, I think there's going to continue to be a lot more target receptors found um, and identified. We're going to continue to get better at our chelation kinetics and our radio labeling. Hopefully, we will get better at our production of some of these radionuclides like actinium-225. Um, and with all of these developments will come a lot more um, radiopharmaceuticals. So we've got some coming up for breast and pancreatic cancer. Another interesting concept is targeting of angiogenesis. So this is um, the development of new blood vessels, which cancer cells can get really good at. Um, so if you're targeting those um, cells in that process, you may be able to help reduce the, the growth and um, spread of some of these cancers. And another interesting concept which will hopefully come about is maybe starting to figure out how to apply a theranostics approach to non-oncology applications. So you neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and also cardiac disease. We've definitely come in a long way in um, developing imaging agents for these, but whether that would ever translate to a therapeutic approach as well um, to create that theranostic, I'm not sure, um, but never say never really. There's also a long way to come in terms of the optimization. So there's potential to improve really any diagnostic and therapeutic agent, considering when we're going to deliver it to a patient, um, how long we're going to take before we image it so we get optimal tumor to background ratio, um, a wide range of things you can optimize there. In terms of the therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals, there's a lot to consider in whether you're going to deliver it by itself or in combination with another therapy, like the chemotherapy that I've been talking about, and whether those two together could have synergistic effects. Um, and then also considering what the administration route is. Um, so at the moment, mm -hmm. each intravenous um, administration is by far the, the most common route, um, but there is also potential to do intratumoral injections or also um, intraperitoneal. So there's a lot um, there that you can look at and change even with established agents. Just my references and thanks for listening. Greatly appreciated, Ash. When you want to develop a radiopharmaceutical, what would be the process? Oh, it's quite complex. Um, I think you either will start with a targeting vector, which you know targets a certain receptor, um, or you could start with a receptor and then try and find a targeting vector to target it. Once you have that, um, it's really then a choice of whether you're going to go down the diagnostic or therapeutic um, agent initially, and then based on what age, uh, radioisotope you use, you'd then need to find a chelator that can then combine the two. Um, and then it would be a series of cell line studies initially for most. Um, and if they're positive in terms of their cell binding, internalization, um, if it's therapeutic, whether they can um, cause cytotoxic effects to cells, then progress to animal studies, and then hopefully to humans. And even in the humans, I presume you have to go through a series of studies to look at the maximum tolerated dose, biokinetic distribution and so on. Yeah, definitely. There's that, the phase zero to phase four studies and you've got to step through everyone to make sure you're giving a, a good product before it's approved. Uh, we have a question. Has there been any progress towards getting better availability of actinium-225? Oh, I'm not entirely sure. I know they definitely are developing and getting better at it. Um, I know there is definitely the accelerated produced option now. Um, I'm not sure entirely how that's going, though. But from what I understand, it is getting better, but it's still not great. Oh, I think there are business opportunities for countries to, yes. to produce actinium-225. Thank you very much, Ash, and you will stay with us for the question and answers questions at the end. This, as you may realize by now, uh,
targeted radionuclide therapy combines physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, and potentially many other fields. And the question really arises, what is the role of medical physics in this newly advancing and accelerated uh, field of medical radiation sciences. And it is my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Mr. Kevin Hickson, who is the head of physics and radiation safety at the South Australian Medical Imaging, but also he's a vice president of the Australasian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine. Thank you, Kevin. Ash, can you stop sharing your screen? Kevin, can you start sharing your screen? Not a problem. Let's try that. So hopefully you can uh, just see the screen. Uh, I suppose Perfect. Eva, I'll just confirm. You. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so this presentation is perhaps uh, a little slightly different from the other speakers who have been focusing on um, mainly the ins and outs of, of theranostics uh, and the nitty gritty detail. Uh, what I'm looking at is of course the role that we play and I use the word we as in the medical physicist, what do we play in that of, of theranostics. Now the medical physicist, the nuclear medicine physician, the radiation oncologist, technologist, radiopharmaceutical scientist, they're all part of a larger multidisciplinary team. And in fact, even on, uh, on the Zoom screen at the moment, I can see that we've got uh, former nuke med techs in the audience. I know that we've got a physician listening in as well. Um, so it really is, I wanna, uh, just focus on this fact that we've got a multidisciplinary team, but the medical physicist um, has a scope of practice inside that. And defining the clinical scope of practice and a credentialing framework in medical physics is going to become um, even more important as this in umbrella term of theranostic starts to hit um, our mainstream consciousness. So as a bit of a disclaimer, I'd like to acknowledge one, the, the views are uh, my own and I express them uh, outside that of my employer. Um, I'd also like to just recognize that a lot of the photos in here are medical physicists at work. Um, they're attributed um, to the artists that are, are set there. Um, part of the ACPSEM's annual conference, we have a photography and medical physics company competition now called um, Arsenic. Um, these photos are, are from there. I must also, of course, acknowledge that um, I'm coming from an Australasian uh, type focus, um, that, uh, that there is uh, a slant on that side. AFOMP, of course, represents a really large community of organisations and uh, your local situation may differ a lot from mine. And in order to support that large community of organisations and, uh, and outside, I'd just like to plug uh, Singapore and advert to them and make everyone aware that the 2022 World Congress in Medical Physics is going to be held in Singapore. Um, so abstracts are closing soon, so please join in. And of course, because I've made a little plug for uh, Singapore, um, I'm going to make a really big shameless advertisement for the 2025 World Congress that's going to be held here in Adelaide. So please um, make sure 2025, keep it in your diaries, uh, come and join the World Congress and then maybe stay and see some of the sites. So as I mentioned, I'm tasked with looking at the medical physics scope of practice. Um, well, it helps if we actually define what a scope of practice is in the first place. So in short, it's a full spectrum of roles, functions, responsibilities, activities and decision making capabilities that an individual within that profession are educated, competent and authorised to do so. So working to a full scope means that you're working to the full extent of your profession as recognised either by a college or by a regulatory body. A scope of practice is not a list. 
such as um, dosimetry, for example, in Theranostics or radiation protection associated with it. Um, but I can understand how a scope of practice might start to look like one. It is also, however, going to include things like domains of experience, such as being recognised not only as a scientific and medical scientific expert, but also as a collaborator, a communicator and a constant professional. And maintaining also that professionalism and currency through continual uh, professional development, so CPD. Um, as I said, your local regulations may, uh, may differ depending on where on the world that you are. Um, but we also like to make the recognition that the scope of practice is likely to change over time as your own personal knowledge and skill set starts to develop or change, or even, for example, we might get new technology. So that scope of practice will evolve over time. So a framework of medical physics um, scope of practice is built on a couple of elements. So the first being uh, training and educational requirements, professional uh, capabilities, so these domains of experience or expertise, credentialing and the extended scope. So this is the list of things that you are credentialed or within your scope of practice. That's the list part. Um, support and supervision. Sorry, my apologies. Um, support and supervision. Uh, are you being um, supervised or are you supervising others? And then, of course, that CPD. So maintaining your own currency. So if we look at the training and educational requirements, um, we want to sort of ask ourselves, all right, and recognising that we are, you know, bulk of us are medical physicists. So who is a medical physicist? Have you asked yourself that? What are the eligibility to be a medical physicist? So for example, do you have the relevant qualifications? Have they or uh, undergone training that may include, for example, a res residency program or an apprenticeship? Um, that program, of course, then covers the safe use, for example, of therapeutic and diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals and all the physical science associated with that. Have you been trained? Have you been trained to safely handle isotopes um, to then use those isotopes to, say, calibrate a spec system, thereby attaining accurate uh, quantification to go and do dosimetry afterwards. We must also recognise that the line is also starting to get a little bit blurry, as Jake mentioned, between what is traditionally considered a nuclear medicine scope of practice and the theranostic scope of practice, which is starting to bring in radiation oncology medical physicists as well. So an example program um, would be our uh, TAP certification uh, here in Australia which, and, uh, and New Zealand. Now within um, professional capabilities, I talked about this idea of domain of, expert, uh, of uh, experience. It's a concept that comes out of what we call CANMEDS, an educational framework out of Canada, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons from Canada. Um, and it's been adopted by many medical groups. And there's an opportunity to consider here um, when we think about medical physicists operating in molecular imaging and therapy in adopting these ideals. So we are medical scientific experts. That's something that you as yourself, you would understand straight away. And we understand that because we're trained to. We're trained at our university level um, to think critically in a scientific fashion. But as I said, there's more to it. You're a communicator in a medical physics setting. 
So the physicist is forming relationships with their par- uh, with patients and their families that can help and assist the sharing of that essential information that can benefit them and their healthcare experience. So for example, you as a physicist communicating the radiation protection precautions to the patient as they're being discharged from an inpatient um, iodine therapy, for example, um, that becomes really, really important. Is that patient going home because they're 80 years old and they're going home to a, a house that's empty? Or are they a young patient who has um, uh, many dependents around them and young children? That communication becomes really important. Are you able to attend things like MDTs per- potentially? Is there a, um, the ability to have productive conversations with the physicians to optimise and assist in their clinical decision making? So, for example, have you ever done a pre-therapy dosimetry where the patient has metastatic thyroid cancer? It's spread to the lungs. Have you documented those findings, compared them um, to, say, the absorbed uh, um, dose in the blood relative to thresholds and toxicities that we might think work um, from an external beam uh, point of view? So that communication comes in written forms as well. So you're a collaborator. So we're working with all members of the patient care team. So this is doctors, nurses, technologists, the radiopharmaceutical scientists, and other physicists as well. Most of you um, may already be dealing with with, um, or doing this a lot in your own practice, but collaborating with others. And a perfect example to bring it back to the patient case is where you might, for example, hand over some piece of clinical information to one of these other um, practicing um, uh, groups. Um, Professional capabilities also include being a leader. And I'm not just talking about being a chief physicist here. That's not what I'm trying to mean. Um, What I'm talking about is responsibility. So taking responsibility for delivering excellent patient care through the activities that you do as a scientist, a scholar, a teacher, or administrator. We also then talk about things like health advocacy. So there's some key concepts in this, but we're really balancing the benefits to the patient against other risks or costs that may be involved. Um, Scholar, again, something inside the profession that we really do understand well. Um, And we understand well because we've been through that academic process. As physicists, we're always contributing to lifelong commitments of excellence in practice and continuous learning. So an excellent example is you logging in and listening to this presentation right now. You're being a scholar. And finally, the next bit is the professional. So you're you're exhibiting uh, high standards of interpersonal behavior, adhering to things like codes of practice or codes of, um, or, um, or other um, conditions, codes of ethics that might be associated with your registration or certification in your own local concept, context. Um, credentialing and extended spoken practice. So this is really where we get to that list of, of things that we talk about in Theranostics. So medical physics credentialing would be a formal review process um, where we look at the qualifications of the physicists, what they've done, what they've been trained to do. And traditionally, we really talk about these in terms of nuclear medicine, radiology or radiation oncology. So Theranostics may be one of these ones that we have to think of a little bit outside the square and look at micro-credentialing. So a really good example of micro-credentialing might be, um, sorry, we just got a little bit of um, feedback there. Um, A really good example might be um, PET. 
So if we look at pet, pets not as um, prevalent or hasn't been as prevalent around the place as gamma cameras. <laughs> and nuclear medicine physicists would be fully across gamma camera acceptance testing, but perhaps not PET. So micro-credentialing um, may lead to things like a PET acceptance credentialing, but also we want you to remember that your scope is likely to change over time as your own knowledge, skills, and experience develop. So finally, details on the actual theranostic stuff of what a medical physicist should be involved with. Now, I think one point that we will make is that specifically um, these services, you know, they may include, they're not limited to just this, and they can also be covered by those other practice groups. So you may be doing some of this, your colleagues may be doing some of this, a technologist, um, the radiopharmaceutical scientist, um, you know, these are, these are generalised things that you would be doing and talking about. So in radiation safety, I think this comes a lot to our mind um, as, as medical physicists. Um, but one of the things that we will be doing is developing or evaluating a radiation safety program. So your hospital, for example, would have uh, ultimately a responsible person who is responsible for the governance and management of radiation safety across that organisation. You as the physicist may be writing radiation management plans and advising that responsible person. In radiation protection, again, you're consulting with patients and families on radiation protection precautions. And being that communicator, you have already worked out their own personal situations so that, for example, it might be um, able to discharge the patient from, home, uh, from the hospital early. Um, it may be um, uh, uh, maybe personal situations where the treatment could be done in other locations other than just um, in, in the hospital setting. Radiation safety, again, one of the key things that we do, and this is something that we do really well, is we determine and test radiation shielding. We don't also just talk about shielding in terms of the wall when we've got a gamma camera, but we're also talking about the optimal shielding to be used um, to a personnel who might be administering the radiopharmaceutical or the theranostic agent. So if it's a pure beta emitter, for example, you should be using um, a perspex to minimize any bremsstrahlen that might be produced. Not only so, not only determining that shielding, um, but testing it as well. And of course, radiation waste management becomes a really important process. And, and our final speaker, I think, will be touching a lot on these radiation safety components of theranostics. Oh, and I nearly forgot, of course, training of radiation workers. Incredibly important if you have a well-trained staff of radiation workers, you're going to minimise any incidents that might evolve or come out of, um, of, of, uh, of your practice in being involved with theranostics. The next really sub part here is um, the equipment. So again, it's not just limited to these. But you as a physicist will be specifying the instrumentation to use in that theranostic setting. So well counters, dose calibrators, spec systems, PET systems, and don't forget software. Software is increasingly becoming a very important part of the dosimetry process. And it's something that we can't do without. So making up or drawing up specifications for things like software, it really should be thought of as an essential piece of equipment inside Theranostics. 
you'll be doing acceptance testing. And I think most of us are going to be familiar with things like the NEMAR NU1 and NU2 standards, but those acceptance testing are important to set baselines and also to um, uh, evaluate the accuracy of things like quantification um, in the system itself. So you want to be developing those procedures for the continuous evaluation against those baselines that you've established at acceptance test. And I mentioned quantification and accuracy. SPECT is no longer one of these things that is just counts. SPECT can be quanti quanti uh, qu quantitative, sorry, um, and it does really help that a lot of the manufacturers have come on board with this. But quantification should also take into account cross calibration between all of the systems that you're using. So your dose calibrator, your well counters, your spec system, your PET system, if it is a PET isotope, it should be cross calibrated inside that dose calibrator. If you are taking blood samples, you need to be cross calibrating uh, the well counter with that dose calibrator with the spec system. And of course, optimal imaging. So how many um, iterations and subsets may be um, needed or optimal to get optimal quantification, but then also optimal image viewing for the clinicians to review those images. Um, the final really sort of part of the list here is something that's been termed temporal sampling and analysis. And I've, and I've stolen this from Kathy Willison um, from a, a previous uh, a workshop that we had a, a week or so ago, I just really like this idea of temporal sampling and analysis because it throws a few things in here. So temporal sampling analysis, we're really talking about you defining protocols for optimal blood um, sampling and imaging. So how many time points are you going to need? Now, recognizing that time points and getting those numbers is also an impact on, um, on the, the, the clinical workflow. Um, there are uh, uh, potential um, protocols out there to do um, you know, one single time point imaging for, for renal um, dosimetry when you couple it with the, the GFR. Um, those sorts of things all become important and as we move through to this idea of theranostics and oncology, I think we need to be um, tying all of those in together in terms of the radiology, the nuclear medicine and the radiation oncology medical physics. Uh, as I said, soft light, software. So you're developing software pipelines. The real point of having this up here is there isn't an optimal um, approach if it takes you 10 days to do dosimetry on a patient. Having developed pipelines means that you can actually start to um, uh, communicate that information back. You will be performing or supervising the time activity curve generation. And again, this comes into your knowledge of things like the instrumentation and quantification. Um, so you need to be performing then, once we have all that information, absorb dose estimates. And that can be voxel-based, as Jake mentioned before, um, or at an a organ-based level. As a medical physicist, and we're dealing again in this idea of scope of practice, is there going to be, for example, um, as somebody who is doing the dosimetry to begin with, and it's going to be best practice that somebody else is going to do patient-specific QA on that dosimetry. Some of these things are going to be needed as we, we move through to the scope of practice in theranostics for a medical physicist. And again, communicate these results. Support and supervision. We really want to see listing, you know, who um, everyone has been supervised at one point. 
one of the questions is, what type of supervision are we going to be requiring here? Is that direct supervision or indirect supervision? Where indirect being, hey, could you please go over, um, review that, uh, that dosimetry for us? Um, is there also going to be some sort of primary supervisor who takes um, a little bit more responsibility for the dosimetry at the, at the time? Now, recognising, of course, that the clinician is going to be, to use an American uh, football analogy, they're going to be sort of the quarterback um, in, in this sense. And the medical physicist, the pharmacist, uh, sorry, radio pharmacist, radio pharmaceutical scientist, technologist, the nursing staff, they're all going to be supporting that. So there's also then other things to consider in terms of supervision and support. So if you haven't performed this work for a long time, are you going to need that support? What's your currency of practice? And that currency of practice then brings us on to CPD. So the idea of the CPD program is to promote um, professionals, not just physicists, um, in this lifelong learning. So you sitting in this, being involved in this CPD program um, to continue your learning. So why is CPD important? Um, it all comes down to maintaining currency of evidence-based practice. So remember, your skills are going to change as things change. Okay, very quickly, I'll just point out radio pharmaceutical scientists, they're going to have a scope of practice as well. Let's not forget them. Their key point is every product that is made is suitable for injection every time that it is made. Okay. For your own reference, there's lots of stuff out there already. There's a number of programs that you'd already be familiar with. Um, Double APM have, for example, this scope of practice. The issue with a lot of these things that are published already, not an issue per se, but one of the things that is common is that it's always nuclear medicine, diagnostic imaging radiology, or radiation oncology medical physics, that is the, um, the realms of the scope of practice. Theranostics is going to be mixing those traditional areas. Again, scope of practice, practice is going to be different depending on your legal requirements. So some um, American states, for example, require a double IPM um, in or have that in legislation. So just in conclusion, we've defined the role that we want to play in Theranostics or that we need to play in Theranostics. I've given you a bit of a framework of the scope of practice and particularly from our um, college's point of view um, and that the scope of practice in Theranostics is really going to boil down what I think these three points. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kevin. And I think it also makes medical physics more interesting because there are new challenges and new skills that people can acquire or will have to acquire during their professional lifespan rather than being left in that same old, same old routine work. I just throw another spanner into the works. Where do you see artificial intelligence in all this? Uh, yes, and in fact, um, it's something you're almost reading my mind, Eva, because I'm, I'm sort of struggling for time here. AI is going to be, I think, one of those practice areas that is going to come into um, that scope of practice of medical physics. AI is potentially a black box in some cases, but things like sensitivity analysis for AI and all those hyperparameters that may be available to be tweaked, um, a physicist is going to have to be coming up to speed with it. And also the engineers as well. We can't forget, forget our engineers, yeah. our, 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 our comm size um, when, when we talk about AI. AI is going to come into Theranostics 
in the fact that um, uh, 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 organ segmentation is already happening with AI. Um, and in fact, um, you know, uh, software such as, as MIM, um, that already includes things like um, AI um, segmentation in it. Um, those things are going to be important. Co-registration could potentially maybe have some AI aspects in it, but I think we've, we've probably got co-registration um, pretty good for the purposes of, of theranostics. Um, dosimetry, I think, is something that, that may bring into AI, but, but maybe not quite yet. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I hope you stay with us for the question and answer session. It of is course. now a pleasure to close the loop of the Theranostics and to finish with out of the most important aspects of the Theranostics, which is radiation protection. And the last presentation will be de uh, delivered by wonderful Daniel Badger, who is a principal medical physicist also from South Australian Medical Imaging. And Daniel is also president of the Australian and New Zealand Society of Nuclear Medicine. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the team and over to you. Kevin, would you mind stopping? Yes, and uh, Daniel, could you be so kind and share your screen? Okay, okay. hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes. Can see everything. Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for waiting until the end. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to have a chat about uh, theranostics and how that affects uh, therapy. So the question is, you know, what is theranostics? Jake has already covered that fairly well. It's when we're doing imaging and therapy using the same targeting vector. Now, there are lots of areas that could be theranostics, but mostly we're talking about nuclear medicine theranostics. So we're doing nuclear medicine imaging and therapy. So Hopefully you're all familiar with radiation safety for nuclear medicine imaging. So it's just the same, right, for therapy, except uh, maybe on a, a larger scale. Uh, now, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out it's uh, 80 years since the, the first theranostics, uh, th sorry, the first ther radionuclide therapy, where Saul Hertz uh, treated Elizabeth D for Graves' disease with a mixture of I-131 and I-130 that had just been made in the cyclotron at MIT. But Dr. Hertz uh, then came up with the idea of detecting and imaging the radiation that was coming from the radio ID. So rather than it being imaging and then therapy first, it was actually the other way around. Did the therapies and then we had the idea of imaging. Uh, so Dr. Hertz uh, started nuclear medicine department in 1949. Fortunately, he died soon after that, but he uh, had a great impact on our profession. All right, so theranostics now, you've heard a lot of things. We're still doing ID-131 for thyroid cancer. Uh, Ash really covered quite a lot of the newer stuff. Uh, some of the things that are still around, ID-131, um, lipidol for pedocellular carcinomas, uh, metoido benzoguanidine for neuroblastomas and pheochromocytomas uh, have been around for a little while. We now have our newer therapies, so the Letitia 177 and Gallium 68 doublets uh, with dotatate uh, and prostate-specific membrane antigen targets. Uh, and uh, we're now starting to see some targeted alpha therapy come in. And of course, there's a whole bunch more stuff. So lots and lots of different areas where we could be uh, doing theranostics. Uh, all right, so today, <clears throat> I'm gonna have a quick talk about the regulatory requirements now. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, it's different in every uh, country, and therefore uh, I can't really give you any specific advice about what might be happening in your country. But what I want to do is just point out a few of the issues in, um, in radionuclide therapy versus imaging uh, that we need to consider uh, when we're thinking about radiation protection in our theranostics. Uh, so we'll be looking at all those things. Uh, let's get right into it. So even in uh, my country of Australia, uh, regulatory requirements are not uniform. Uh, mostly though, through Australia and throughout the world, they're based on the ICRP. Uh, and so we have things like effective dose annual limits. Uh, 
which are generally one millisievert per year for the public uh, and, one, and 20 millisieverts for radiation workers. Uh, skin and or absorbed dose annual limits can be a bit variable. Uh, in uh, my uh, location, South Australia, um, our limit is 50 millisieverts of the skin averaged over one uh, square centimetre or 500 millisieverts to the hands and feet and 150 to the lens of the eye. Uh, there's also lots of differences in disposal of radioactive waste. So uh, in, again, in South Australia, we have an annual application to dispose. Uh, and so anything that exceeds the exempt uh, limits, according to legislation, uh, you need to get approval to dispose of it. Um, and we can only dispose of liquid via the sewers. We're not allowed to dispose of solid waste. So it may be variable where you are. So you need to do your own research on that area. Uh, I can't really advise much more than just think about uh, a whole bunch of things. So how is our radiation safety different to imaging? So firstly, we're often administering higher activities. Uh, now, in the case of targeted alpha therapy, uh, because of the very high doses per activity administered, then we will probably actually be administering lower activities, but it's certainly a uh, higher dose. Uh, different radioactive emissions. So instead of primarily gamma emissions, we're talking about betas and alphas and uh, other things. Uh, we need to maybe consider chains of radioactive daughters uh, and also nuclear isomers uh, that may be present in our uh, radiopharmaceuticals. And of course, the different half-lives, different amounts of uh, uptake and different exempt levels. So your regulatory limits are often lower for more hazardous materials and therefore that can lead to waste uh, disposal issues. Uh, the other thing is that we are intending uh, to put a lot of activity into the patient. And so there may be a high level activity still in the patient after the procedure is complete. Uh, now, if you are doing clinical trials and a lot of theranostics are currently in trial periods, we have those same uh, legal limits often and we have the same risks, but we haven't done it before. So uh, that's uh, something that we really need to consider, you know, what could be uh, the issue with this new thing we've never seen before. Uh, and so you want to be quite conservative when you're starting off. And then when you find you don't have problems, you may be able to relax some of your precautions. Okay, so I just want to compare some of our therapeutic radionuclides uh, with uh, good old technetium 99M that uh, is used for uh, imaging. Uh, and you, so you can see uh, some of the things that uh, <clears throat> Ash mentioned uh, was the longer half-life. So over the order of a week rather than uh, a few hours. Uh, obviously, particle emissions for therapies. Uh, and if you look at actinium-225 there, then we have uh, five alphas and two betas in the chain there. So quite a large number of um, emissions. And of course, I've ignored the electrons in technetium because they have such low energy. Uh, photon emissions, this is why we can... Although in many cases, we would use uh, PET uh, radio pharmaceuticals in a doublet to get those nice, super crisp images. Uh, what I want to point out is the dose rate for droplets on the skin. So if we're talking about radiation protection, uh, the dose rate significantly higher for our beta emitters compared to technetium. Uh, bit of a misleading figure there for the alpha emitters because, of course, they don't penetrate into the skin. But if you get them uh, inside your body, then that's uh, another thing altogether. So not very much activity. Uh, is necessary to go onto your skin to exceed the South Australian annual limit for skin dose in just 12 hours. So seven kilobecquerels for ID-131. Uh, so it's uh, much more uh, important to consider where uh, about contamination when we're talking about those. Now I mentioned PET and of course, uh, fluorine 18 we're very familiar with. Uh, and with the uh, positron emission, it has a particle emission. And so it has a very high skin dose rate. In fact, higher than Letitia-177 and ID-131 would have. But because of the much shorter half-life, uh, it means that we have a bit of a reprieve for stuff that we leave on our skin for long periods of time. Uh, I would hope, of course, that we wouldn't be leaving anything on our skin for 12 hours, but this is assuming you don't detect contamination and then someone goes home and it's sitting on their skin until 
uh, they uh, have their bath or shower uh, the next time. Uh... <coughs> okay, so for uh, radiation dose, we need to consider who could be exposed. And there are a number of different groups. Of course, the main people who are getting radiation dose are the patients. And so what we need to consider mostly are what are the deterministic or the risk of deterministic effects for off-target organs? Uh, are we going to do dosimetry? Are we going to tailor the activity to patients? Uh, or are we going to just use a cookie cutter approach and just give everybody the same activity? Now, excuse me, because I do have a cold. <coughs> Not COVID, I just got my test results a few hours ago. Um, but um, <coughs> uh, if I have a coughing fit, then you'll just have to forgive me. Um, we also need to consider our staff. So uh, these people are involved in the treatment. They're maybe involved in a large number of treatments throughout the year. And so uh, we need to consider the radiation dose that they're going to get uh, externally, but really contamination is the main thing. Um, skin doses uh, are really high uh, and for small activities. And so we just need to make sure that we are considering that contamin contamination risk and eliminating it. Uh, then the next group of people is the public. And this is what we're gonna consider once we uh, let the patient leave our uh, hospital, where will the patient go? What will they do? How radioactive will they be for how long? And who will be nearby to be exposed to that radiation? So you need to follow through all of these things and consider um, everything. And of course, there's the environment uh, and what do we do about uh, leftovers? So either patient excreta or uh, radiopharmaceuticals that are excess to requirements and don't get into the patient. All right, so I mentioned there's a number of factors. Obviously, when there is more activity or a higher total dose, then everybody can get a higher dose. Uh, and so that's uh, quite important. Short range emissions mean that we get a higher dose for skin and contamination events and intake events. Uh, and so that's uh, very important to consider. Uh, the other thing is that because we are getting really good at targeting uh, and in the case where we have patients with a very high tumour burden, then quite a lot of the activity is actually retained in the targeted tissue. So this ex increases the external dose rate, uh, which will affect uh, both staff doses and member of the public, but it also increases the excretion time. Uh, so as the tumour cells die, uh, and then they release the radioactive material back into the bloodstream, and then it gets excreted by the patient, we can end up with uh, contamination risks for a very long period of time after the treatment has been done. All right, so Ash mentioned about uh, uptake uh, of large molecules. Uh, and so the longer half-life of the radionuclides allows time for the transport of uh, the radio uh, pharmaceutical into the tumours. Uh, and in particular, we maybe want to penetrate deep into the tumours, into less vascular regions, or with large molecules so that we can get good targeting. Uh, and that allows that, but it also allows excretion from the part of the body that we're not intending to irrad irradiate before some of the decay happens. So what we end up with uh, doing is reducing the off-target dose. Um, the thing is that, of course, we have uh, increased dose to others because of the longer half-life means that we have excretion uh, and potential contamination over a long time period. It doesn't decay away uh, very rapidly. Uh, and it means that we can have an external dose rate for some period of time that is very high. Uh, all right, now, disposal of waste to the sewers. This uh, is quite a touchy subject. Whether you can do so depends on your local legal requirements. Some uh, jurisdictions require capturing liquid radioactive waste, so patient urine and storing it. I think that is one of the worst ideas in the world. Um, and using delay uh, tanks is just increasing the risk of a terrible spill. It is much better to dilute uh, the radioactive material into wastewater so that it is very rapidly spread out over very large areas, uh, large volumes of water. Uh, and there's very good evidence uh, that that results in uh, negligible or even undetectable levels of radioactive material in wastewater by the time you get 
uh, a short distance out of your uh, hospital. Something to watch for though is bioaccumulation at your disposal location. So in the S bend of toilets, um, in the drains here, uh, you can see uh, my arms where I'm checking uh, some bioaccumulation in a shower drain um, or uh, mold. So we get bacteria, molds, and other microorganisms that actually will collect our radiopharmaceuticals, uh, iodine in particular. And so you can now end up with fairly high dose rates um, where you expected it all to have been washed down in the sewers. Now, if you're generating solid waste, um, <clears throat> often you'll have to keep and decay that um, if it's above the exempt limit. Now in South Australia, our exempt limits are 0 0.05 megabecquerels for iodine-131 and 0.5 megabecquerels for letitium-177. Uh, so firstly, you have to know how much you have so that you know if it is exempt and how long you have to keep it. Um, so <coughs> this is where having theranostic radionuclides is helpful because you can use a calibrated monitor that's sensitive to the gammas um, and take the reading for some distance away, reduce your dose and also reduce um, errors due to geometry. Uh, but um, in particular, Letitia-177 uh, doesn't have a high proportion of gamma emissions per decay. And so I only detect uh, about 10 uh, counts per second megabecquerel uh, at one metre away. And uh, the exempt level then is five counts per second at one metre. Uh, and the natural background radiation though is about 10 counts per second. So uh, it's easy to uh, make an error in estimating the activity, particularly if you're further away than one metre. So if you're in doubt, then overestimate the activity. You have to keep it for a bit longer, but you know that you're not throwing something away that is still uh, radioactive. All right, so if you've got some waste, you need to put it somewhere uh, and you're going to keep it for some time. So we're talking about half-lives are about a week. Uh, if we have, say, two gigabecquerels uh, left over from a therapy, uh, then we need 12 to 15 half-lives for that to be e exempt, and that's three to four months. Um, small amounts of activity spread over large amounts of volume, so we can have food waste, so from saliva, uh, dirty linen. Uh, you can get large uh, volumes, but also because you're keeping it for many months, it can start to get a bit stinky. And some people have suggested having a large freezer in your waste store for storing those sorts of things. Uh, as you can see from my picture here, we would need a number of large freezers to be able to uh, do that. The other thing to consider is for your waste store is security. So obviously you wanna stop your waste uh, walking out, um, but you also wanna make sure that people don't add things to your waste store particularly if it hasn't been labelled and you don't know what it is, what radionuclide it is, what the activity is, it can be a bit of a disaster trying to work those things out, particularly if you're talking about um, low energy beta emitters like tritium or carbon-14 with long half-lives. That uh, can be terrible. All right. Uh, the nuclear isomer of iodine, uh, sorry, of letitium-177, uh, in some ways that you make letitium-177, you also create letitium-177M. Uh, and I'm sure everybody's calling out on the Zoom what the half-life of letitium-177M is. It's 160.4 days. So it's much longer than letitium-177 at 6.7 days. And the exempt limit in uh, South Australia is only 0 0.05 megabecquerels. So that means that even if you only have a very low initial contamination level, so about 0.1% is what we're quoted by a supplier, then you can end up with uh, large activities uh, of letitium turning into fairly uh, large relative activities of letitium 177M. So for four gig, you end up with four meg. And we need to keep that in South Australia for 2.8 years before we can dispose of it as not radioactive. All right, so I wanna have a look at um, some of the specifics around different people getting radiation dose. And we'll start with the patient. Obviously, we're intending to irradiate these people, um, specifically their tumours, but we also know that we're going to irradiating all of the nice parts of them we want to keep. So we need to consider deterministic effects, and there are going to be, depending on your radiopharmaceutical, um, some organs that are at risk. Uh, generally, we're talking about kidneys, liver, and the bone marrow that are 
uh, the organs, sensitive organs, but also getting higher doses. Um, the other thing is to consider when you're actually putting the radioactive material into the patient is the risk of extravasation of not uh, of getting uh, it into the uh, local tissue because we can get very high localized tissue doses um, and that can result in uh, severe uh, burns, necrosis, the need for plastic surgery uh, to fix these issues. So the first thing you want to do is plan to prevent extravasations. Um, you then also need to have a plan about what you're going to do if after all your efforts, you still uh, end up having an extravasation of a therapeutic radionuclide. The other thing is contamination of the patient. Um, an incident recently in our department was that we had a patient who was incontinent, but they were embarrassed to mention that they had had an accident and they ended up having over a gigabit of Letitia 177 Dota tape uh, in their trousers uh, for an unknown period of time before we found out. Now, potentially it could have been two to three hours, but it's more likely that it was uh, of the order of um, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, potential dose to the skin here, uh, depends on how uh, spread out uh, and whether it's directly on the skin or it's in uh, the clothing, but we're talking about of the order of one gray per hour of skin dose. Uh, and it doesn't take very many hours before we end up getting quite severe deterministic effects at this level. Now for this particular patient, uh, we don't appear to have had any uh, deterministic effects. So that's uh, very fortunate. Um, but it's something you really need to be uh, on top of is when you have large activities uh, being excreted by patients, where does that go? Make sure that it goes down the toilet, doesn't end up on the patient's skin or spread around your department for that matter. All right, for your staff, um, it's unavoidable that we're going to get some external dose. And in nuclear medicine, of course, we're very familiar with being exposed to radiation, uh, typical uh, annual doses for nuclear medicine uh, staff are of the order of one to four millisieverts per year. Uh, the big problem, as I've mentioned before, is contamination um, of persons and spills where there are much higher risks, but they should be entirely avoidable. Um, even if you have spills, we should make sure we set up our, our area so that we can quickly remove any contaminated material um, put down absorbent material barriers, etc. So we want to make sure that we check our trolley and our staff who are doing the procedure regularly for contamination. Um, the other thing to consider is airborne radioactivity. So generally, we have a low risk of aerosolization of these materials. We have them um, trapped inside syringes and lines, um, but we are possibly going to be dealing with some radionuclides that have gas daughters, in particular radon, that is um, uh, part of the radium-223 and the actinium-225 decay chains. Again, not a lot of radon will escape unless you have a spill. So you put some on the floor or somewhere, or if you leave the caps off syringes and you can get a, a stream of radon um, evaporating out of the uh, solution and into the air. Now, the radon has very short half-lives in this case, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it goes away because it has daughters. Um, those metal ions are going to stick to dust in the air and stay suspended probably in the air. And you do need to know if you have a spill with one of these radionuclides, where's the radon gas? Where is the radioactive dust going to go? Is it um, being exhausted from the room? Is it going um, back into your staff or patient areas? Uh, you need to know what's going on before you have the spill. All right, so here I have one of my staff who's uh, wearing some uh, personal protective equipment ready to um, administer uh, lutetium dotatate therapy. Um, and remember that our annual limit in South Australia for skin dose is 50 millisieverts over any one centimetre squared. Um, so with the skin dose rates that I mentioned, 130 to about 600 uh, millisieverts per hour megabecquerel, then a 10 megabecquerel droplet on the skin. And remember, we're dealing with uh, tens of gigabecquerels of activity. Uh, that can give us a 50 millisievert skin dose uh, in a period of time of just 30 seconds to maybe a few minutes. So we need to make sure that we are 
regularly checking because our regular nitrile gloves um, or latex gloves only reduce the dose rate by about 40%. Um, so consider thick gloves as shown here, we have gloves that are, are about two millimeters thick um, to reduce the radiation dose um, through the gloves uh, to the skin. But the main purpose of course, is being able to remove the contamination by changing the gloves and removing the sleeves immediately after handling the radioactive material. <clears throat> All right, so for lutetium dotatate, uh, we get 40 to 60% of the administered activity excreted in the next few hours while the patient is in our department. So we need to consider contamination from patient urine uh, and <clears throat> um, make sure you have the toilet near your treatment area, make sure it's exclusive to your patients and have some removable absorbent material to aid clean up. You can see I've also added um, something to protect the rim from overflow so it doesn't go down the toilet uh, and have a radioactive waste bin and make sure there's something for washing hands. And of course, you need permission to dispose in the, in the sewer before you can um, put lutetium down the toilet. We have instructions for our patients to make sure that our males uh, sit uh, to urinate and they make sure they direct the urine stream down. Close the lid to flush because flushing does aerosolize um, two flushes and wash your hands carefully. And we also get all our patients to wear shoe covers and we get them to change them when they exit the room and put new ones on so that if they have urgency, they already have one on to go into the uh, toilet room. Other contamination to consider, patient linen, lines, cannulas, gel coats, patient blood, uh, including if you uh, have to take um, patho pathology samples, Patient saliva, so patient pillows, cups and utensils, the floor of the treatment room, um, so contamination from uh, saliva, from sneezing, spitting, coughing, talking, but also uh, contamination from uh, the bathroom being tracked out. So here's a, a patient room after uh, radioiodine therapy, uh, and uh, with my detector, I found uh, that there was something radioactive uh, here, uh, and uh, it was turned out to be 0.1 megabecquerels of dried nasal mucosa, um, and this is above the exempt limit in South Australia, so this had to be collected and put into our waste store. Um, all right, members of the public, um, obviously the friends and family of our patient have the highest dose potential. Um, if it's a, there's a large contamination risk, we need to make sure that we keep the patients in the hospital somewhere controlled to make sure that they aren't spreading radioactive material around. Um, generally, we're mostly considering about an external dose from being near the patient for extended periods. And most of the dose is going to be to their spouse um, or children because they're going to be uh, with the patient the most <coughs> for the longest period of time. So these need the most consideration. All right, so if we send the patient home, how do we decide if it's okay? There's some recommendations um, of 600 megabecquerels and or 25 microsieverts per hour to meter. Is it good enough to just take that cookie cutter approach? The Alpanza code of practice for the medical applications of radiation protection, uh, RPSC5 requires that we make arrangements to ensure that the limits, the legal public limits are not exceeded. So we need to have some calculations um, about what the doses are going to be for uh, the members of the public. Also, are the excretion contamination levels from the patient safe and okay? Remember those annual dose limits. And often now we're doing multiple cycles. So if you do multiple treatment cycles, then you need to still comply with that total limit in a year of one millisieve. So if you have four cycles, that means you can only give the member of the public who is exposed for every cycle. So the family member, 0.25 millisieverts for each cycle of treatment. For patients with low risk, you can probably discharge them earlier if they're going home, live alone. But patients that have higher risk, they don't understand or they're not going to be compliant, then you might keep them longer. Um, if your patient is too hot to send home after your therapy, and if you're doing therapy as a day procedure, do you have somewhere to put them? You need to consider that before you start making people radioactive. All right, so we're sending the patient home. What instructions are you going to give them? Are you going to give them 
precautions about the contamination with their urine and their saliva. If the patient is incontinent, then what do they do with their incontinence products that have become contaminated with radioactive material? Um, do they have close contact with others? Uh, what precautions are you going to give? So our PANS's RPS 14.2 uh, gives some generic instructions, um, but the code of practice requires a qualified expert to check the assumptions about radiation procedures. And you need to look up what uh, needs to be done in your uh, jurisdiction, obviously. Do you think the patient will actually follow the instructions you give them? Do you need them to be conservative? Um, so Gabriel et al. in 2011 found that only 35% of the patients they surveyed complied with the instructions that they were giving. And those people knew they were being surveyed. So it's probably actually worse than uh, 35%. Um, all right, if you have patients that are very ill, so they have substantial disease burden, then what about if they have to stay in hospital after the treatment? Or what about if they get sicker and they turn up to your emergency department the next day? Do you have instructions for your hospital workers who are caring for them or people who might see them um, later on? Have you given them a letter or card to carry with the instructions? And it may just be there's no precautions to be carried out. Um, but uh, that's important because it can prevent over... Um, compensation for unnecessary risks, such as hosing ambulances out um, in the car park of your hospital. Is this gonna be one of your patients? Uh, in this case, we had a patient who sent themselves home from hospital early after receiving radiotherapy. We didn't have a legal way to uh, restrain them. Uh, and then once they went home, they uh, used their backyard as their toilet. Uh, and so we had to end up removing um, over 300 kilograms of soil and other contaminated material uh, to reduce the radiation dose rate um, in his backyard to uh, acceptable levels. Um, <clears throat> it was very hard work. Um, and uh, the other thing that you need to consider here is, uh, so I received some acute radiation damage on this day. Because I wasn't wearing my hat, I received uh, some sunburn to my uh, face and neck. So be careful when you're doing that. All right, other things you need to consider as a last few points. So you need to uh, make sure that your nurses and doctors, uh, not just in your nuclear medicine department, but others who are caring for these patients have been trained and they may need to be monitored depending on your legal situation for radiation exposure. Now, the problem is um, we don't do as many of these therapy procedures yet as uh, many other procedures. And so we need good training because it's infrequent, particularly when we're talking about spills and emergency care situations, which may never actually happen. But we need to make sure that our staff know what to do. And the problem is that for infrequent but important tasks, we need to have more training and refreshers because people just aren't used to it. Do you have someone on call if there's a question or an issue after hours, if your patient has been admitted to hospital um, and then something happens, who's going to fix it? Who has the expertise? Is it your medical physicist um, that is on call? Um, what about pregnant staff? Now, your pregnant staff may not exceed the public limit normally, but what about if there's a spill of radioactivity? Could they get more than a millisievert to the fetus and therefore should they be excluded? Um, and the other thing is to consider patients who go to other institutions. So if they're not going home, but they're going to a nursing home, a rehab facility or somewhere else, do the staff there become radiation workers when they're caring for your radioactive patients? Do you need to give them instructions? Do they need, uh, do they have legal obligations on what they should do? And it looks like I finished uh, almost exactly on time. Uh, so uh, I think it must be time for the Q&A session. Okay, thank you very much, Danielle. Before I uh, invite the other speakers, can I quickly ask you about the survey meters? How often they should be calibrated and do they have to be calibrated specifically for different isotope use? That's a really good question. And it, it is going to depend quite a lot on your uh, particular jurisdictional requirements, whether you need to have uh, something that is calibrated to a primary source. Um, in terms of 
um, measuring activity, really, as long as you can demonstrate that you're not disposing of uh, non-exempt amounts of radioactivity in contravention with your local regulations, then I don't think that you need to have something that is really accurate, but you do need to make sure that um, it is regularly checked that it operates correctly and that you compare it to some sort of um, standard. Um, I calibrate all of uh, my equipment to um, the specific radionuclides because uh, you have different uh, activities will give you different numbers of counts depending on the detection um, sensitivity, but also on the actual uh, emission uh, probability per decay. Um, you also need to consider whether you have backups. So we had a situation not long ago, actually, where our main uh, survey meter uh, had a fault, uh, and then uh, you need to make sure that you have another one on hand uh, if that happens, so that you are still able to estimate the activity uh, that you. <coughs> Sorry, that you are having your waste. Yeah. Can I please then ask Kevin, Jake, and Ash to join us? Now, in regards to, for example, airborne uh, radioisotopes, apart from personal monitoring, should we be having also area monitoring detectors somewhere on the walls of the departments? I, I think it is a good idea to have area monitoring um, just so that, and something that actually has an audible tone. Um, I like to have that particularly in the hot labs, but so that when you walk into a room, you're immediately can identify, oh, it's a bit um, hotter, a bit more radioactive than normal. And so you can identify that there's been a contamination or something else has happened. I think that is really useful. Um, it's also, in terms of airborne radioactivity, it depends on what you're actually doing and what the risk is. Generally, we take great pains to reduce the risk of aerosolizing or having any airborne radioactivity. And so if the risk of that is very low, then I don't think it's necessary to have, for example, vacuum pumps pulling things into filters. But it may be a regulatory requirement or it may be for the particular radionuclides that you're using, that there is a risk for that and that you might want to have something specific for that. So in particular, if you're handling radon producing um, materials, then uh, it might be an idea to know how much radioactive dust you're actually generating from that. Very fantastic. Ash or Jake, uh, can you use targeted radionuclide therapy also to prevent cancer from spreading, from metastasizing? I'm happy to answer this one if you want, Ash. Go for it, Jake. Um, so we do this for one of our therapies, so for radioiodine for thyroid cancer. Um, the context of that is patients have had their thyroid removed already surgically, um, so it's called a thyroidectomy. Um, so the, the actual point of the radioiodine is to basically mop up any remnant thyroid that got left behind from the surgery, um, but also pick up any micrometastases or subclinical disease that um, we didn't surgically resect. So in that way, we are preventing um, micro metastases from going from micrometastases to um, clinical metastases. Can you also eradicate the circulating uh, cancer cells? Yeah, so if it's an IV administration or if it's an oral, as long as it's systemic, um, we'll be able to pick up any cells that are targeted in the same way. So for example, as long as they're uh, follicular thyroid cells, uh, we'll be able to use iodine to target them. Mm -hmm. Ash, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I think Jake's covered it all pretty well with iodine, but um, there's definitely like the tumor antivascular alpha therapy um, where they're suggesting that alpha therapies um, may be able to disrupt some tumor capillaries, um, which are more likely in your micrometastases and whether that helps with disease progression. Um, and also really any target could possibly be overexpressed in a micrometastasis. So it's developing therapies that are more commonly um, expressed towards like the advanced disease as well, I guess. 
I think that antivascular effect is very important because then if you block the vasculature, you can kill the tumor by starving it to death. Uh, uh, Danielle, you wanted to add? Yeah, I just want to add, so for uh, iodine-131, lipidol for hepatocellular carcinoma, we're quite often using that as an adjuvant treatment. So the pre-cancerous, uh, pre-HCC cells in the liver actually take up the lipidol very effectively. And so even if we've surgically removed all the HCC without an adjuvant treatment like lipidol, then we get a very 80% um, reoccurrence rate of HCC. And so by doing that treatment, we can reduce the risk to the patient of, uh, even though there are no uh, actual cancer cells left in the patient, of a reoccurrence of the disease. So it certainly is something uh, that Theranostics is not just treating prim primary cancers or metastases, but we can use it in a preventative way as well. Oh, fantastic. Kevin, how do you establish good radiation safety culture? and commitment to continuous professional learning in a department? Wow, what a question. Um, you so, are the host. <laughs> I think you've, you've well and truly picked up on um, culture. I think, um, you, you know, putting a, a, a management hat on um, if we look at things like um, some of the Google Aristotle project, one of the big things that came out of that was the idea of psychological safety. So the idea of psychological safety is that everyone in the group, regardless of their position or their experience, feels safe in that environment to raise an issue. And this goes again with, um, with, with anything um, in terms of radiation safety, but if you think even um, uh, in terms of the airline pilot industry or the airline industry, it's very regulated, and um, and the 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 co-pilot has full ability and safety to be able to raise an issue when it, they become aware of it, and it is the obligation of the pilot to view it. It's quite analogous to um, that idea of a safety culture. I'm also a big believer in um, uh, coupling with that no blame, but no blame doesn't mean no responsibility. Mm. And that comes back to that, that another one of those pillars that I mentioned, um, the, the professionalism. And I suppose while I've got the floor as well, we'll, we'll just sort of shout out there. I apologize to the radio pharmaceutical scientists that we can't spend more on your particular topic. Um, it's such a vital um, uh, part of the Theranostics chain um, and we'll, we'll recognize, yes, I mentioned you, but I didn't mention you enough. <laughs> Thank you. We have again a Theranostic question. Do the bigger targeting vectors have a stronger bond to the radionuclide compared to smaller targeting vectors? That is, are antibody compounds more likely to stay intact during decay compared to peptide compounds? This is the actual over it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say you could generalize and say that a peptide will always be better bound to a radionuclide or vice versa. Um, but because peptides are more likely to be synthetic, they can be more modified to potentially not degrade as easily. Um, antibodies do have really limited, um, say, temperatures and pHs that you can work with. Um, so they're, they're probably a little bit more flimsy than a, a, pe a peptide or a synthetic. Um, anyone is, there add a, is there an additional problem when the antibody is maybe animal derived, like a mouse antibody? Um, well, that would have issues with the like cross reactivity between um, animal and humans when you put them in. So that would cause an issue. Um, the other thing is if there is the radionuclide decay, um, the antibody may still stay bound, but the actual antibody and the binding component um, might be affected. So it could stay bound, but whether it's actually going to go to your target or not still, who knows? I think there is also an issue that you can use it for the first time 
but then the uh, your own immune system or human immune system will develop a, a ready a resistance against that antibody. Kevin, you were saying? And I, I was just sort of going to lead on a little bit through that, the difference between a beta emitter and an alpha emitter with multiple daughters. So that, that alpha particle having that recoil energy and therefore potentially, um, uh, you know, a high probability that it is going to become unbound um, from either an antibody or a, or a peptide as well. So the, the, whether it's a, a, an alpha emitter or a beta emitter may also become quite important. Important, yeah. How do you optimize those in the target using individualized dosimetry of theranostic? I think this is a million dollar question. So, Anyone? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to start and then probably move on to Jake as well. Mm -hmm. I think what we need is, is, is a number of things. So optimising um, in individual dosimetry, we're talking about pre-therapeutic dosimetry. So this is using those other um, isotopes um, that may be, uh, sorry, um, uh, say that the copper, copper uh, is a perfect example where you may have a therapeutic and a diagnostic isotope that we could potentially look at the biokinetics of those to tailor that to an individual dosimetry um, uh, procedure. Individual dosimetry is going to be um, uh, quite interesting because really the only mechanism or one of the only mechanisms that we have is the administered activity. And the administered activity of, of that uh, is also then potentially, if we look at um, uh, the, the um, uh, you know, amino acids, for example, that are given prior to uh, lutetium dotate, um, is the amino acid then changing that biokinetics? Well, absolutely. So it's more of a, how do we optimise? We need to know the biokinetics. Yeah. I can carry on a little bit as well. So I guess the optimal dose for your target is... Jake, can you come closer to the microphone? Sure. Yeah, so optimally you give the target as much dose as possible, but in radionuclide therapies often we're limited in the administered activity by the normal tissue doses. So we, we basically have to work out what the dose to your bone marrow per unit of administered activity is. And then we might set a threshold of two gray dose to the bone marrow. And then so based on that, we can choose our administered activity. So we'd really like to give as much activity as possible without observing normal tissue toxicities. And like I mentioned, the, the organs that are most at risk of these normal tissue toxicities for radionuclide therapy is most often bone marrow and kidneys. Can I ask you, do you prescribe based on the body mass or do you prescribe based on fat free mass? So for radionuclide therapies, it depends on the therapy, um, but the physician or the nuclear medicine specialist, they take in lots of things into account, basically their clinical history. So it could be um, the stage of the disease, the age, um, lots of different things, but often it's not a body mass related thing. Um, it is for diagnostic imaging more so um, because it's more related to image quality. Uh, yep, do you want to add it? Um, I'm sort of reminded a little bit of um, iodine MIBG, particularly in a pediatric population. Um, something like a pediatric population is probably more familiar with body weight, um, uh, scaling, um, but um, you, it's not uncommon to have a set prescribed activity um, because that's actually what the clinical trial did originally. And going outside that, in some cases, may be considered off label. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, picking that activity is again when we individualize it with the biokinetics. And as Jake um, pointed out, if we can throw more activity at it without um, uh, going over any of those threshold toxicity uh, values through bone marrow and kidneys, then that's exactly what we're gonna do. 
Daniel, what advice would you give to a patient treated with iodine-131 who is going home to a six-month-old baby that wants to be held and cuddled and fed? Yeah. Now, of course, that would depend quite a lot on uh, how radioactive. We take a number of measurements of our patients uh, in order to uh, get a good idea of how radioactive they are and how radioactive they will be. For a lot of our patients uh, who are uh, young women, and they have good renal activity and they have uh, the uh, recombinant um, thorough stimulating hormone injections. Um, many of them clear out the radioactive uh, material so quickly that we actually don't need to give them any instructions with regard to their children. Um, but uh, if they are still a bit radioactive, then we would often advise them because the child needs to be held by someone to make sure that they have someone around who is able to hold the child um, for the uh, restriction period. Uh, and obviously, um, if they're at that age, we need to have made sure we've eliminated breastfeeding because uh, that would be a significantly uh, higher dose to the child of uh, in the breast milk. Can you see a role of theranostic in treating uh, difficult cancers such as pancreatic cancer or glioblastoma? Yeah, definitely. I think um, as we keep finding these new target receptors or new biological pathways that we can hopefully um, look into, I definitely think the hypoxia uh, cancer stem cells um, targeting of those could be really beneficial in these hard to treat cancers. Um, pancreatic cancer is one of the key ones that has that stromal barrier. So if you can start to break that down, then you definitely may have more potential there as well. So you could be injecting directly into the pancreas to overcome the barrier as well? Yeah, that's definitely another option um, you could do. I'm not sure if they would do it into the brain in glioblastoma, um, but the pancreas um, could be a possible option for uh, intraperitoneal or intratumoral injections. Wonderful. Has anyone investigated intra-arterial injections? I believe I've seen at least one paper comparing it to IV injection, um, but it's definitely nowhere near as common as just IV. I know that there are some departments in Europe looking at it, just again to... Um, uh, trying to increase the uptake into the target organ. But I think that's, again, an area that we should watch out for. Of course, the intra-arterial injections will have additional risks and will require specific training for the, for the clinicians. Now, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank the speakers very much for the fantastic presentations. And I hope our audience have learned a lot. Certainly I did. And I would like at this stage to hand over the screen to the AFOM president, Professor Aaron Chogle for, for some last words. Uh, thank you, Professor Yuva for organizing this AFOM school webinar the sixth into the series, and also conducting, introducing the speakers, moderating the question and session. It was very lively. Thanks to Jack, Ash, Kevin, and Daniel for taking out your time and giving us the additional knowledge, recent knowledge. I am sure that all the participants must have been benefited by this uh, extraordinary lectures, which uh, Eva has facilitated organizing this thing. So thank you very much, each one of you for taking out time and enlightening us various aspect about uh, the nuclear medicine related topics. Thanks to Eva also. So I will just, um, uh, the in the series of FOM webinars, monthly webinars, which started in June 2020, the 19th webinar, FOM webinar, will be on December 2, 
2021 during 7 a.m. GMT to 8 a.m. GNT, and the topic will be monitor unit calculation for photon and electron beams. And the speaker will be Dr. S. D. Sharma uh, from Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. And the moderator will be Lam Thi the uh, Nguyen, that's we call Lam from Vietnam. I'm trying to involve each and every one member of the APOM by giving the youngsters because they are the youngsters who are going to lead us all. So we try to involve each one of them. Okay, established the speakers, established moderators, they are there, but still the youngsters are given opportunity. So the link and every information is given on the APOM website. So you can log in and register. Similarly, at the seventh APOM school webinar, the last of this year is on radiation shielding requirement for radiotherapy facilities and shielding adequacy evaluation. Because in one of the uh, AFOM school webinar, uh, the some of the participants also written to us uh, asking shielding requirement calculation, this requirement. So that will be on 18th December, 2021 Saturday during 6.30 a.m. GMT to 9.30 a.m. GMT. And this will be moderated by me. And that will be, uh, there will be actually three speakers from a Atomic Energy Regulatory Board and from BARC. You can register uh, on this thing. The information is on the website. AFOM, uh, AFOM webinars will continue in 2022 also. And already the schedule for the January to June is already on the website. Uh, and uh, uh, the every month we will give the link and uh, you can join to that thing. Also, you know that AOCMP 2021 is being held in Dhaka uh, in a hybrid mode during 10 to 12th December 2021. And uh, uh, the sum of uh, the participant from the low income countries and even other countries, uh, 30 um, participants will get uh, the exemption of or, or reimbursement of the registration fee, which uh, details are given on the AFOM website. AFOM has started a lot of awards and a lot of activities. So please do visit to the AFOM website to get yourself updated. AFOM newsletter, the issue will be coming soon. We'll be finalizing by 15th of December. So please submit any article information for the forthcoming AFOM newsletter. With this thing, thanking you, each one of you for participating. Thanking Eva for organizing, moderating, introducing, and all the speaker, Jack, Ash, Kevin and Daniel for spending the time. The recording of this AFOM school webinar will be available on the AFOM website within 48 hours. So people who have missed or could not completely listen to it, they can uh, see it from the AFOM website. So once again, thanking you all for your participation and uh, have a nice time, safe time. And we meet uh, again on 2nd December for the APOM webinar. Thank you very much. Have Thank a nice day. Thank you, everyone.